I definitely was inspired by somebody I was watching, but at the same time, when God shows me something that somebody's speaking about, and I take it, and it just, I can't preach like that person, no matter which way I tried. But the fact is, God makes it our own, and makes the word alive for us right here today. Amen? I choose not to reinvent the wheel. If I see somebody have the revelation, I steal it from them. <laughs> as simple as that. Not gonna... And I, I believe because of his revelation, I got many revelations. And because of that, I got this message. So are we ready for it? Yes. Yes? Are we ready for it? Yes. Yes. Amen. Let's get excited about this. I, I'm going to look at Mark 8, 22 to 26. Mark 8, 22 to 26. And I'm, I'm just uh, been learning lately that I'm trying to slow down on my messages and not go so long. So I, I'm trying to, I have so many things I could talk about. So I have to kind of limit my scriptures. And then hopefully go on the next week and the next week and forever until we go to heaven. So we have a lot of time to talk about the Word of God. Amen? So we might as well focus on one thing at a time and just get at it and dig in and eat some. Get your knife out. Get your steak knife out. And let's start chewing the Word. And let's really get excited about what God is doing here. Before Mark 8, 22 to 26, uh, in that chapter, he was just finished feeding the 4,000th. Um, and the people came out of their communities and brought, uh, came to Jesus because Jesus had to feed them for the sake of that they were not close to home. Did you realize that? That he had to feed these 4,000 people and plus men and children, I mean women and children. He had to feed these people because they were not close to home. And they were saying there, and this scripture specifically was talking about that they were with three days without food. Just imagine a three-day revival that nobody wanted to leave. And Jesus was talking, and they were around Jesus, and they, they traveled to see him. They, just like when there's revivals, people travel to see something that God is doing. Amen? And so when we go in this place, this three days without food. So they actually were fasting through the time that Jesus was speaking. They were actually fasting. They were denying of themselves to be fed by the word of God through these three days. And so when Jesus said, well, we can't leave, go the, uh, let them go without food. We need to feed them. But we weren't ready to stay for three days. We don't have anything for these people. But we can't send them out because he said some are from far off. Some were from far off. And so when we go into that place of knowing that we have to be out of the community sometimes, we have to get out of our familiar sometimes to be blessed. Get out of your houses Get out of your familiar states. Stop thinking you can do it by yourself or yeah, because these people had to leave and travel for days to get to where Jesus was. It wasn't enough to say, Jesus, oh, thank you that you died for us, or thank you, Jesus, that you're out there. It wasn't enough. They had to go to a place where they could receive, right? They, they had to get out of their hometown. They had to get out of their houses. And they had to starve to hear Jesus. They had to grow their stomachs. They had to, because for three days, just think, it says for three days they didn't eat. Just think that nothing was offered to them in three days. Like, you just think about it, right? Are we willing to do that to get some revelation? Are we willing to go the extra mile to see what Jesus is doing? Are we willing to sacrifice our familiar state are we willing to get rid of our blindness? A blind person is pretty smart, wouldn't you agree? If they know the area, they know the steps. It's one, two, three, four, turn. They know their steps. They kind of know exactly. They get familiarized. We get so spiritually blind, we know our steps. We're crazy. We get so familiar, and then finally we just don't even think about it anymore. We just do the same thing every day. That's called religion. Every day, the same thing. We just walked our spiritual walk the same way every day. And I want to talk about how we need to get out of that place because we can't receive in the place in a state of blindness. You can't receive in the place when you don't get out of the familiar and choose to get into the supernatural and to get into something amazing. You can't receive. People say, well, I haven't heard many people say, well, I'm just going to pray at home and I'm, I'll, I'll receive there. That's great, but you have to get out of an unfamiliar state, and that's very difficult to do that at home in most places, in most cases. Wouldn't you agree? 
Now, if you go to your friend's house <laughs> and you go sit and have coffee, you seem to have more fun there than when you go to your house sometimes. Why is that? Because you get out of your familiar state and you've got something refreshing going on and you're starting to open your heart and you're hearing more things than you ever heard before. You get out of your routine to hear something. Wouldn't you agree? You go to work every day. Eventually, the people become common in your life. And all of a sudden, you treat them like an object because they're common. And we don't respect the people around us no more because it became a familiar state. We become blind to the very promises and the very blessings that are around us because they became familiar to us. All of a sudden, this ministry doesn't work no more because we became familiar. All of a sudden, this doesn't work no more because we became familiar with it. And because we, we became blind because we kind of know our steps. We know God works here. That's all great. But we become blind to the very essence in front of us of how God is so working in us, but we're blind to it. Even as leaders sometimes, we do miracles every day, every time somebody new comes up here, they receive something so great and so big, it becomes so traditional to the people of this church, of this ministry, that we become so familiar with it. It becomes a blind spot to us. So now that what God is doing, we're not experiencing His love no more because we are blind to it. We need to wake up in that place and we need to grab a hold. To, we need to lose that blindness and a lot of other things I'm going to be talking about. I want to wake us up. I want us to remember that Jesus, whenever he spoke, the, the odd time he went to the synagogue, but that it was also out of sight of people's houses. And that every so often he ministered personally by washing the feet in the home or having supper in the home. But when he spoke to multitudes, he always brought them out to some place where they could be heard and where they could be gathering, where they could get out of their familiar state so they could receive something great. What would happen if Jesus would have gone into the place of the Pharisees and start doing what he did on the mount to do what he did in those areas of the 4,000? First of all, they might not even fit in there. I'm not sure how big that building is, but, but the Pharisees would have came against him. Wouldn't you agree? This way, at least only one or two or three Pharisees came to check up on him. At least it wasn't the whole crew of rejection and persecution that came against him. It was only only certain people that were sent out to check it out and challenge him. Just think what happens when you get out of your familiar state. You get out of persecution. You get into a place of blessing when you get out of a familiar state. I'm going to be talking more spiritually and physically. I'm just giving you examples. I'm not telling you to run out of your house and run away. I'm not telling you to do that. Actually, I'm going to do right the opposite. I'm going to teach you how to, be, how to go back home. I'm going to teach you how to go back home because many of you guys are not home. You think you might call it home, but really you're not home at all. You guys are so occupied. We are so occupied in, we are so occupied with everything that we're far from home. We're not even close to who we are because we're to, so busy trying to do everything else that we're not. God wants to move forward and he wants us to lose something so we can gain something. Amen? So let's look at verse 22. And he comes to Bathsheba. I think that's how they say it, right? Beth Bethsaida. There we go, Bethsaida. He comes to Bethsaida. And they bring a blind man to him. And sought him to touch him. Which means they desired. They brought this blind man to Jesus and said, Can you touch this man? Can you? They desired a touch of God. They touched a, God, a, a healing for this man. So they came into this town. They came into this town called Beth where, where they were common. This was a f familiar state of the blind man. This was familiar. He lived here. He knew the place. He was blind. And he made his uh, daily events there so that he knew exactly what he was doing. He was in a culture and he was in a rut of where he was at. He was blind spiritually. It became a rut to him because that's the only thing he knew in a state of blindness. We are that place too. There's only those things that we know how to do in a state of blindness. We become spiritually blind, so we just do what we know how to do, and we hope someday we will see something more. We hope someday we might have a glance of a bigger picture, a glance of a bigger purpose, a glance of a more destiny, a glance of healing, a glance of financial freedom, just a glance, but we're in a state of blindness. We made it in a familiar state, so we walk in a familiar state, because that's what we know how to do. 
So this guy was living in a town, and he was blind there, and he was there. That's where his problem was. His problem was that he was in a place where he was not being blessed, and the place where he couldn't receive. He was in the place of that blindness. This blind man means mentally blind also. Jesus, I believe, puts this in the Word of God so we can relate for it today. Amen? Physically and spiritually. So if you find a physical blind person, we'll deal with that. But we also want to deal with the mentally blind people, okay? Because there are many mentally blind. I believe I have, a, uh, I have a blind spot in my life. There are blind spots in our life that we have to deal with every day that we can't see God in. We don't know how God is in it, and we don't know why this happened or why that happened. We don't understand God in those situations. Would you agree? I need you guys to... Amen. Yes, okay, thank you. <laughs> Let's just really get involved here because what I felt all afternoon and when God makes me change the whole message within a couple of hours without notice, there means something to it, okay? God is doing something here. I want him to have full credit here. I want him to be a wide and blessing that we would need. I don't even can't talk straight, hallelujah. When I can't talk straight, then I know there's something going on. And then again, <laughs> that happens almost every service, doesn't it? <laughs> Verse 23. <laughs> Always something going on. And that's what we're going to give credit to. We're going to give God credit to my stumblingness of talk. Verse 23. <laughs> and he took, he took, everybody say took. He, say it again, took. Yeah, he took the blind man by the hand. He took the blind man by the hand. Ho, ho, ho. This is going to be good, guys. He took the blind man by the hand and he led him out of the town. Everybody say out of the town. Yeah, he's, get out of that town. Get out of your problems. Get out of your situation. Get led out of that place. Do not stay where you are blind. Just get out of there. Let somebody lead you out of that place of your familiarity. Let somebody lead you out of your blindness. Let somebody lead you out of there right now. Because if you're not going to get led out of there, you're not going to see. You need to get led out of the familiar state because you will not receive sight in the town where you are familiar with because you are not going to receive because you're, you're comfortable with your blindness. This guy didn't need to be healed. He knew his way around. But he got healed because there was a concern of people and they desired him to be healed. I desire, to, when I talk to people when they're mentally gone, I desire for you to see more. I don't desire for you to say, oh yeah, I got it already. Don't, nah, yeah, no. I don't, I don't desire that. I desire hungry people. I want to lead you out of your familiar state. I want to take you by the hand. Jesus wants to take you by the hand and take you out of your chaos so that you can see and so that he can pray, and so that the blindness in your eyes can be open once for all. Amen? Ooh. He led him out of the town. But let's just focus on the first half of Scripture because I got so much there. And he took, this is where he took, he catch, he take, he laid a hold of this person. God is going to catch you right now. He's going to lay a hold. He took you. He's, he's saying, I got you, man. I, he's catching you. He's catching you. He's taking a hold of you. He's grabbing a hold of you, and he's taking. And he's saying, I got you. He took him by the hand. It's an action of catching that what Jesus is. He, he took. He caught. Jesus caught his revelation. He caught him. Amen? He took him by the hand. And this word, a hand, he's, he says, he took him by the hand. This hand, when he takes my hand, I, I, I'm leading you with my ability. I'm leading you with my power. I'm leading you with my, the, the very essence of who I am. I'm leading you with my strength. I'm leading you with everything I am. I'm leading you. That word, hand, represents his full power, his full anointing in your life. It represents that if you let Jesus lead you out of your blindness, that he's going to have the fullness of the anointing. you are going to be released in your hand, the full ability. He's going to catch you. He's going to catch you for a purpose. He's going to grab a hold of you. You're going to be able to take a hold of who you are. You're going to grab a hold of who you are, and you're going to be led out of your blindness today. Amen? And you're going to grab out of that. There's so much blindness in life. It could be blindness of relationship. It could be blindness of healing. It could be blindness of, of family. It could be blindness of finance. It could be blindness of sickness. It could be blindness of everything. Sometimes we're so blind, we don't even know where to go no more. We're sick. We're suffering. God, I don't know where I'm going. I can't see what to do. I, I just don't know where. And then sometimes we just don't know how to see. We've got to be able to take the hand. We've got to take the ability of God and we've got to trust his leading right now. We've got to trust him because that blind man had no idea where he was going. He took him out of the familiar state. He had to walk and he oh, feeling stones he never felt. He felt grass he never felt. He felt, he, he felt a road he never felt. He felt things. He, he, he was trusting and he was walking. Have you ever done the blindfold trick and you're trying to walk somewhere and you have no idea where somebody's taking you? You have to trust that person because he could take you totally into a chaos. 
Okay, just imagine this blind man walking with Jesus. And he was taking, Je taking the hand of Jesus, and he took Jesus' ability, and he caught on Jesus. He caught on who Jesus was. And he finally grabbed a hold of him so that he could have more than he ever had, so that he didn't have to stay in the familiar state. You know what? <laughs> okay, I can go. <laughs> Praise God, we're going to go on with that soon. I don't want to go ahead of myself because I kind of have a platform here that really is not there, but in my head there is, and I'm trying to stick with it. <laughs> so that's what happens. When people take notes, they know how to follow it. I'm trying to follow something that's in there, and it's not always working because I go ahead of myself. And so he led him out of town, and, and then he had spit on his eyes. So the thing is, the other thing is, <laughs> for you that is seen, it might be gross, for, but for the guy that is blind, he can't see what's happening anyway. He has no idea what that sound's going about to do. He just didn't. It was just. Jesus said, "Open your eyes, okay? I'm going to try to see now." And all of a sudden, boom! There's something wet in your eyes, you know. But the fact is that we get grossed out by the supernatural. But when people are at the altar call and they're receiving something, and you see something weird going on, you see something going on, and they're receiving. Everybody out there is saying, oh, man, that guy's crazy. But this guy here, he's just saying, oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. He's receiving because he's the one that was receiving the prayer. He was the one receiving the blindness. He doesn't care what's happening as long as he gets what God has promised him and what he's asking for. That's all that matters to that man. Amen. We are the judge that are watching the person that's receiving. This guy just came. Do whatever you take. You want to spit twice, spit twice. It doesn't matter. As long as I can see, amen? As long as I can get out of the state of my mental blindness so I can see forward God's purposes so I can hear his voice, so I can hear his direction, so I can hear the very essence of who he is. Amen? Oh, he wants that so badly for us. He went out of town. He spit on his hands. And he, and he put on his... <laughs> I agree. Here we go. And he had spit on his eyes and put his hands on him. For, and he asked if he saw anything. Okay. Just think about this. He's asking, did you see something? Are you seeing anything? Here's a revelation I just got before I walked out, okay? Are you ready for it? Are you ready to just kind of cut this into a place and eat it and chew it the way we never had before? Are you ready for that? Okay. In verse 24. And he looked up and received sight and said, I see men as trees walking. See, that sometimes what we do is this. We receive and we say, yeah, I feel better. But we're not willing to take that better. We're not thankful for that better. He says, why not be thankful for that better so you can get another shot of him? He says, I got the better now. But just imagine this, okay? There's a two-part process that was happening here. I believe this. When you look at this, and you look at the meanings of all this. Uh, so this is better. <laughs> oh. You don't see the fullness of the body of Christ the first time God prayed for. He saw trees. He saw men like trees. What I believe is this. He looked at them, and he saw the spiritual concept of people. Because Jesus says that we are like trees planted beside waters. Amen? Sometimes you have to understand that your spiritual eye has to be open before your natural eye can be opened. Amen? Your trees. We look, men look like trees because we are trees. He saw something spiritually. He saw something moving. He saw people rooted in Christ Jesus. He saw the trees. Amen? Amen? amen. I know you're not sure about this yet, but you can say amen and <laughs> repent later. But just think about it. That he saw trees walking. He saw people in the supernatural, but he didn't have full his physical, full eyesight, but he saw people walking in opportunity. He saw the supernatural abilities. He saw, be, he saw the first part of his eyesight. How many of you know that most healings, you have to deal with things with spiritually first? You've got to be able to see something spiritually. You've got to have some hope first. You've got to grab a hold of something, amen? So this guy saw trees. Just... <laughs> Trees, like men like trees. And so there was a first part of healing. But I also believe this, is that sometimes we don't connect to the body of Christ the first time we get prayed for. Because he don't connect fully to who they are yet. See him as trees, 
he didn't have the fullness of spiritual insight of the connection that he needed yet with the people. He didn't see them clearly. He didn't see them clearly to connect with them. So it's important to see spiritually first. Trees are, are rooted. Then verse 25 says, And after that he put his hands again, which means fresh on again, anew. See, the Lord prayed for this man once, and he saw trees, men like trees. Then he says, okay, I'm going to give you a fresh portion. Were you thankful for the first portion? Were you thankful that you saw a little? Were you thankful that you felt better a little bit? Are you thankful that you at least got something, you know? No, we're not sometimes. We think we have to have it all. And if we don't see God do it all, we wonder where he is. But we have 50% better, and we still don't thank God for that 50% sometimes. God wants us to be thankful for the very blessing of those things. Amen? Amen? And so when we walk into that place of verse 25, it brand new, on his eyes again, and then he made him look up, and which means he re that word looked up in the Greek is to receive sight. The first scripture too. He looked up, he received sight. This is actually the word that represents in the Greek to, that he looks up and he was receiving sight. He was receiving the sight. You look up. It's an act of receiving. It's receiving sight. And so he saw, and he looked up, which means he received sight. And he saw, and he was restored. And every man was, he saw was clearly. And he saw every man clearly. So his eyes, his mind, the first time he was foggy. He couldn't understand everything he was seeing. His mental, we're talking spiritually now. If you want to talk physically, we can do that too. But we're talking spiritually now, okay? Are you okay with that? And so when he saw in his mind, and his eyes mean that he saw with his mind, he was the part of knowing, the part of perceiving. He didn't perceive clearly the first time you prayed. Sometimes people come up here and they don't understand what happened to them. Sometimes people get prayed for and they don't understand what happened at the first part with them. They don't understand the fullness of what happened there. And then they have to come up again. And so they can understand it. We have often people come up to three times at prayer altar because they didn't understand the first time. They, they want more. They want that next step. God, I want it today. Amen? This man didn't wait for the next day. He waited for the same day, and he was restored. So this is a place, I believe, spiritually blinded, but he will now, he says, now I see men clearly. I understand clearly. I understand my connection to this person. I understand my connection to that person. I understand how I need that person. I understand how I need that person. I understand how I need you. I understand how I need you. He saw the men, which means the mankind. He saw the church. He saw the people that he needed around him. He saw clearly, and he removed the blindness from him. And he said, I get it. I need you. I get it. And we're looking in that place where he physically got it, but he also spiritually got it. We have to learn how to translate the scripture into spirituality so we can get our mental blindness out of our way. Many times we're looking men as trees, and we're just so focused on the spiritual end of things, we forget to see who God has created them to be. We need to grab a hold and remove the blindness from our life so that we can connect to the people that can help us be healed, so they can connect to the people that can help us move forward, so we can connect to the body of Christ, so we can be part of something bigger than we can imagine or think. Amen? That's what I say. My water. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes. Did I hear an amen from the child? <laughs> amen. So I like that idea that we need to get our blindness. What is your blindness today? I want to tell you one thing, is that we all have a kryptonite. If you, and anybody here hasn't watched Superman, doesn't know what kryptonite is. Anybody ever know what kryptonite is? Superman was a, in, the, in, the, in the place of uh, a story, place of a storyline. Um, he was a man that could do everything except when he had kryptonite in his life. Then he was nothing. We have all those kryptonites. And we have to live in restrictions in our life. And I got this from the message I've listened to. We've got to listen to the restriction in our life. We have restrictions that we need to stay away from. No matter how healed you are from something, if it was a weakness point in your life, and if it's a kryptonite in your life, you need to stay away from it. It could be pornography. It could be hamburgers. It could be smoking. Whatever you want to try to get rid of. What's something that is really interrupting your life. It could be drugs. It could be... Whatever. It could be swearing. It could be anger. It could be whatever it may be. Okay? I'm trying to, trying to paint a bigger picture here. 
But what kryptonite do you carry? Are you willing to do what it took? To What are you willing to do with it? Are you willing to put your computer aside if that's what's interrupting you? Are you willing to put your kryptonite away? Are you willing to stay away from the very thing that you have to resist yourself from? Now, how many know that if you have, have any kind of disease like celiacs or sugar diabetic, if you don't stay with the plan, it's going to harm you? Would you agree? It's the same thing with our spiritual. If we, if we need our diet spiritually to contain ourselves spiritually, we need to be healed spiritually, but we also need to contain ourselves spiritually. We need to maintain ourselves spiritually. Just like we would have to do as a sugar diabetic or as any CDX. If you you got to stay away from bread if you're that person. you got to stay away from products that you can be the happiest person in life if you just stay away from your kryptonite. Amen? If you are a diabetic or if you are in anger issues, if you stay away from the things that tick you off, the things that trigger you, if you remove yourself from those circumstances before they happen, that is your kryptonite you have to choose to stay away from. If we have an addiction, you have to remove yourself from that addiction and you need to choose to stay away from that addiction because that's your kryptonite. You want to be healed? You've got to start plaguing away the things that are causing you to be sick. Amen? You've got to start seeing a Ahead of time, you got to remove your blindness and get yourself out of the state of familiarity so that when those things come at you, that you can see it ahead of time so you can stay away from the things that are not meant to be yours. And then, truly, you will stay healed. I guarantee it. I see in it. If you can maintain that, then you have to remove that kryptonite in your life. You have to remove that very thing that is your weakness. I, I, I think that sometimes we are, want to be so spiritual and say, well, God healed me from it. Well, then praise God for it, but then why are you going back to the sickness? Get out of the town and stay out of town. This blind man could not even go back. I'm going to share that. You have to stay out of the place that you got delivered from. You can't go back into a place where you were blind once. You got to get yourself out of that place that held you back, the place that kept you religious. Sometimes it could be people's families, religion. They come and get healed and they go back to that family sometimes and it becomes their kryptonite. It becomes their sickness. It becomes every time they go back, they have to get it redone again. It's a place, sometimes it's this, sometimes it's that. We have to choose the very thing that we have a weakness in, the very thing that draws us down, the very thing that takes us and blinds us from the blessing of God. We got to choose to remove ourselves from those situations as much as possible. So hang around with the people that care for you. Hang around with the people that don't have something against you every time you talk to them. I know that's harsh. And if you want to hang around with your family, I'm not saying you shouldn't, but then remove yourself when you feel that it's getting to that point. Don't stay there if you're being poisoned, if that's what I would say, if, if you feel that you're poisoned. Some people say, I'm not doing nothing bad. Well, yeah, but it's about how you feel. You have to remove yourself and then regain yourself and regain your sight again so you can go back there with eyes. So you can see. It's like, it's like don't go to bed with anger. It's the same idea. Remove yourself from the anger so you can see what is really happening, not the anger seeing what's happening. Amen? Not the blindness what is happening. And verse 26. And he sent him away to his house, <laughs> saying, Neither go into the town, nor tell it to anyone in the town. He says, Okay, I took you out of the town for a reason, and I'm telling you, don't go back into the town, and you don't tell them something. You know, the very first thing we do sometimes, we think that we have to go save the people that got us into sin. We, sometimes we think we have to save the people where our stress was. We sometimes think we have to go back there and, and say that we're going to be the power for them, but that's false because this Bible says don't go back to the town that you've been delivered from. Because we, sometimes we say, well, well, I need to save them. Well, yeah, then start praying for them and start telling somebody about them. You can do long-distance service. You don't need to go into the town. You don't need to go back into your familiar state to shine Jesus. You can shine Jesus from the hilltops. You can shine Jesus from many places. You can shine Jesus by your actions. You can shine Jesus by many things. You don't need to go back into that situation where your weakness was, where your blindness was, to, and you just gain the blindness back. And this was Jesus' command at this point. He says, <laughs> don't go back to town, but he says, go home. You, he says, you haven't known yourself for many times. Look at yourself and say, I'm, I want to be home. 
because if I want to be home, this is going to be George Batts. It's not going to be nobody else. This is my home right here, okay? You need to be home. You need to be comfortable with your house. You need to be comfortable with your vessel. You need to be comfortable in who you are. You need to know who you are. You need to be able to be relaxed in who you are. You know, like when I, I know when I go home and I don't have many people come down to my house because it's my house and I just, I, I, I take my socks off and I throw it across the room and nobody cares, you know, well, my wife does, but, um, <laughs> but it's my house, right? I take it and if I get hot, I take my pants off if my kids are not around. It's my house, right? It's, I'm in a place of comfort. I'm in a place where, where nothing bothers me. It's, 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 it's me. It's I'm here, right? And the same thing with the spirituality. When you're home spiritually, you can just be you. And the, this person won't threaten you. That person won't threaten you. You'll just be uh, happy to be home. You'll just be happy to be you. You'll just be happy to be in your house. Amen? Like, what do you do in your house? You relax. You, you are at ease. You, you get things done sometimes. But you get... <laughs> You move forward and you are in a refuge when you are yourself. And you need to, do, Jesus says, go back home. And we're talking physically and spiritually. Go back home. Don't go to the town where you're sitting blind, but go home where you can be in refuge. Go home where you can be yourself now. It's something that you haven't been home for a long time. You haven't been home for a long time. You've been trying to prove a point to, for too many years. You've been trying to heal somebody for too many years. You, you keep going back to the things that you don't need to go to right now. But I want you to go home so you can be you. And so you can be relaxed in who you are. So you can be graceful in who you are. So you can walk in who you are. So you can be at home. Amen? Amen. And so he says, don't go back into that place. And I can tell you by helping many Christians that everyone that gets saved, everyone that gets healed, they need, think they need to go save their whole family right away. I know that. I've mean, I seen that, right? I want to see my family. The fact is, they saw Jesus leading you out of there. They saw the Holy One taking you by the hand. Don't get me wrong and don't get them wrong because the religious see Jesus in your life. They saw Jesus in that town. They saw Jesus. They desired that man to be touched with Jesus. But they didn't desire him to get radical. But they, they saw Jesus take him by the hand. They saw Jesus lead him out of the town so they knew that he had Jesus. Amen? So out of your circumstances, out of your times of trouble, wherever you are at right now, if you think that person didn't know that you had Jesus, you're wrong because they saw Jesus taking you out of the situation. They saw something they haven't seen before. They saw people see again. Amen? You were the biggest witnesses by leaving your circumstances, not by entering back into it. When you removed yourself from the blindness, was a bigger witness than going back to your blindness. Amen? So when you stay away from your trouble and you choose to move forward in Christ Jesus, that is truly sight. Now you don't have to live in your circumstances. You don't have to live in your addictions. You don't have to live in that place. You're home. You're home. You're home. You're home. <laughs> <laughs> I'm George Blatz, and God loves me this way. I'm not trying to be you. I'm not trying to be you. I just don't even want to go there. That's right. I just don't want to go there no more. I don't want to try to be that pastor or that pastor or that pastor. <laughs> this is who you get. I'm going to be as, uh, as clear as day. This is who I am. And you might not like the way I talk. You might not. It doesn't matter. I'm home. Me and Jesus got a thing going here. Amen? I, I, I'm home. I'm at my house. And I'm, when I go to my physical house, it feels the same way. Put my feet up. Do whatever it takes. Hug my kids. I can do the thing. Uh, you know, you can you do things that you don't do at church. Kids know things about you that people at church might not even know about you. Because you're at home. So sometimes they're graceful about not telling people. But other times they tell people. But it's a, it's a matter of relaxation of life. Amen? I, I, I know when people get married, when they date, they are so different. But when they get married, they find out a lot of things about body functions and everything else. <laughs> All of a sudden, it doesn't matter no more because they're home. Right? We have to understand spiritually when you're home, when God sends you home, you're in a place of refuge and you're not judged. No condemnation, no guilt spiritually. You just get to be you. Isn't that great? I just want to be me, God. 
I want to touch millions. I want to touch people, but I want to be me when I do that. My number one thing is to be with you, Jesus. The people are the thing that you allow me to be and give me a privilege to talk to, but I want to be with you, Jesus. I just want to be home. And when I'm home, I can do so much. I can think. I can relax. I can. I'm not trying to be something else. Amen? Amen. But sometimes we have to stay out of town. Stay out of town. We can go miss a couple of scriptures there. And between 26 and 34, um, Peter, when they were saying, do, who do you think I am, Jesus? And they said, well, you're the son. And then the Pharisees came against them and so forth. And Jesus spoke harshly against the Pharisees at that moment. And Peter took Jesus actually to decide. I, I didn't see this before, but Jesus actually on 33, I think it's Jesus took, or 32 maybe, but 33 or, thir 32 or 33 or both the scriptures, either way, those scriptures there. Um, Jesus Peter took Jesus to the side and rebuked Jesus for doing what he did. And then Jesus goes, get behind me, Satan. <laughs> and just think about that. Here's the Peter that thinks that he has to correct Jesus. And sometimes we think we have to correct Jesus. Sometimes we just say, Jesus, come here for a minute. I'm going to tell you a little bit about me that you didn't know. Jesus, God, I, don't, I, I wouldn't do it that way. God, come here. I got a plan. And Jesus says, Satan, get behind me because he's trying to steal the kingdom. But don't we do that? Sometimes we think we know it. God, come here. Jesus, just like Peter did, Jesus, come. I'm going to rebuke you for a moment here because what you did to those guys there, <laughs> I don't know about that, you know? And sometimes we get to that place. We get to that zone and... and, and it, I, I, I would like to study that more, but I just, when I just read it like that, it just makes, in the King James anyway, it's just like, Peter pulled Jesus to the side, and Peter rebuked. And then Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And sometimes we don't think about that. Sometimes we think that we have to pull Jesus to a little conversation and talk it out with him a little bit and ask him, do you know what you're doing to me? Do you know what you just said there? Sometimes when I preach and I say something, I say, God, what did you do? Like, wow, that was pretty bold, God. Like, what did I, like, oh, <laughs> like, do we really want to go there? And then he says, yeah, you go there. And then later on you feel terrible because you went there. But God says, shh, don't worry about it. You know, sometimes we have to walk forward in it. Verse 34. And when he had called the people to him and his disciples also, he said to them, who so well become after me, let him deny himself and take up the cross and follow me. Deny yourself. Deny the place that you were at. Deny the place of familiarity. Deny the place of comfort. Deny the place where you just have a routine. Deny that place where you think you know all the steps, but you're not willing to take the extra step. Deny the blindness. Deny the place of blind spots. Deny those places, basically. Get rid of yourself. Get rid of what you know. Get rid of who you think you are. Get rid of that control. Get rid of everything that you've been there. Get rid of it. Deny it. And then follow me. This is what this guy had to do. He had to left out of town. Don't go back there. You're following me now. You, you got it now, man. He had to leave the life that he knew. He had to leave the people that he knew. He had to just couldn't go back to the town. And he couldn't tell nobody in the town that he got healed. And what happens to us is that we sometimes get healed and we go back to our religious status or religious influences and we say, oh, look, what, like, we got a like, oh, God, I got ministry. And all of a sudden, we get talked against, right? Because we got healed. All of a sudden, we said, that, that was not of God. That was this spirit and that was that spirit of an operation, but that was not God. And all of a sudden, these people are talking against it. And I believe that's why Jesus says, don't go back and tell them. Because if you go tell them, they're going to take that away from you. We are too many times, we go back to our hometown, we go back to our troubles, we go back to our circumstances, and the very thing we receive, we don't receive no more. We get stale and we get blind again because we believe the voices around us. We're too busy walking backwards. And this is, he says, I want you now, after this scripture, you just read it all there together if you want the chapter. No, after this, I want you to just deny yourself, pick up your cross, pick up your purpose, pick up, pick up your lot in life. Pick up the destiny I have for you. What you thought you were, that's not what you are, because this is what you are. You, have a, you already have preordained 
to work for me. You're already preordained to live for me. You're already preordained. I have a plan for you. Deny that plan that you have for yourself. And plan to be with God. Amen? Amen. Then it says in the next one, like verse 35, it says, and whosoever shall lose, uh, who, sorry, who, and whosoever shall save his life, which means sozo, which means whoever wants to be made whole, whoever wants to be delivered, whoever wants to be fulfilled, or whoever wants to stay away from danger, whoever wants to stay away from destruction in their life. That's what the word save means there. If you want to save yourself from your danger that you're in, you shall lose your life, which that word lose means you need to destroy it. You need to destroy your past. You need to destroy your blindness. You need to destroy those places that didn't work for you. You need to destroy those places in your life. I'm not talking about people. I'm talking about your circumstances spiritually. You need to destroy it. Amen? You need to deal with your past quickly. You need to deal with the things that you come from. You need to walk out of that and you need to lose it. Everybody say lose it. Lose it. Yeah. You need to be able to willing to lose it. You need to, what are you willing to lose to see? What are we really willing to lose to see the fullness of God's move? What are we willing to lose as a church, as a ministry, as a Christian, as a body of Christ? What are we really willing to lose? What are we willing to lose? Are we willing to lose buildings? Are we willing to lose cars? Are we willing to lose, are we willing to lose something? And I'm not saying that you have to lose cars. God's going to bless you with it, but you have to be willing to let it all go to be able to let God fully in your life. Basically, spiritually, we have to lose our wrong thinking. We have to lose our addictions. The, this man was not that he was not with God because he was blind. It was because he wanted to see, okay? It wasn't that the addiction that kept him from salvation, but it kept him from seeing where God was going to take him. Amen? It wasn't a place where he was condemned, but it was a place where he couldn't move forward of the blessing where God had him in. He couldn't go home. He couldn't go home. He couldn't find his house. He had to stay in the streets so that he could live because everybody was being pitiful to him. So in your state of blindness, you have to receive pity because that's the only way you can survive. You can't survive with the sight of God. You have to survive with the pity of people. But now because he saw the trees, now he saw the man, now he can survive with the body of Christ, not with the pity of people, but he can survive as a body of Christ. Amen? I'm not talking mercy. I'm talking pity. I'm talking about a place where people just see and they have to support you because that's all that they can do for you. Amen? This man had to probably be dragged out there every day just so that he could, he had to live on the streets. He had probably had to live in that town. He had to probably, just so that he could survive, okay? Sometimes we are blind and the only way we can survive is to live in our old patterns because that's all we know. God wants to move us out of those old patterns in your life. In my life. Amen? And then he says, You shall lose your life. Destroy it. But whosoever shall lose it, whoever you choose to destroy it, if you shall take it, his life, he, for my sake, then for the gospel, <laughs> and the gospel, then the same shall save it. Huh. He says, Now if you're willing to, let it all go for the sake of me. He didn't ask you to let it go. He's only asking you to lose it for the sake of the gospel. For the sake of Jesus Christ. For the sake of my promises. For the sake of what I have for you. For the sake of the purpose and destiny I have for you. That's what I want you to lose. I want to lose you to lose that so you're willing to go here. Amen? And when you're willing to go there, then you're going to get saved. And that word saved there is not just like, oh, I get to go to heaven. It's sozo. I get to be made whole. I get to be delivered. I get to be set free. I get to be healed. I get to be prosperous. I get to be prosperous in my soul. I get to be blessed. I get to have all that God has for me. I get to be safe from destruction. I have the covenant of God. You need to listen to it. I spoke on Sunday, the covenant. You know, I get to grab a hold of the covenant. The covenant is starting to work for me now. I don't have to worry about nothing no more. Amen? I had lost that life. And now I can move forward in that life. Amen? So, my question is this. What are you willing to lose to gain your home? What are you willing to lose to gain your house? What are you willing to lose to gain what you're destined to be? What are we willing to lose for your destiny? Are you willing to lose your bad habits? Are we willing to lose addictions? Are we willing to lose those things? People say, why do you always say addictions? Is because those addictions keep you away from God. No matter which way you want to talk about it, you can talk around the clock about it, you can do everything you want. If you have addiction, it keeps you away from God. Wouldn't you agree? If something controls you to the point of addiction, 
that becomes a God. Wouldn't you agree? We need to deal with it. That's a blindness. We don't know how to get out of it ourselves. That's 100% blindness. We don't know. We just go in the same pattern. We finally get free for a bit. Hallelujah. I feel good. Then we go back. That's what addiction is. Addiction is getting out and back in. It's, it's, it's an ongoing yo-yo. Can't see. You're just going in the same pattern all around. It's a crazy cycle. That's what it is. A crazy cycle. You need to get out of the crazy cycle and get into God's cycle and get out of that town. Amen? So today, that's my message because I didn't want to speak too long. So I made sure I just put about three quarters of a page down of Scripture and then I was going to go for it. Did you receive today? Amen. I feel that God wants to touch us today and I want Him to get out of my blindness. Like, I mean, the things that I can't see clearly, I want to see. What about you? Things that I don't understand in my life, I want to see. Uh, the things that I don't get, I want to see. The things that, uh, and Lord, if I have to leave something behind for that, I'm, I'm willing to lose that to see what you want in my life. And I think sometimes we're, we're not willing to lose family. Sometimes we're not willing to lose the people around us. Sometimes, and the very people that we don't want to lose are the ones that hold us back sometimes. If you lose them, you'll get saved. And when you get saved, you most likely will save them too because they will see the salvation in you. Amen? We got to get away and just choose to let go. The biggest, hardest thing is when, you're, when we have religious families against us or when we have religious people against us or we have a sphere of influence. And when I say religious, I'm not preferring to a church. I'm just preferring to people that always come against you and debate against you because you're doing something different than they are. And when you do that, that's what I'm talking about is that something we just have to remove ourselves from the situation. Amen? And we have to choose to get, I'm not going back to that town. The Bible even says that if they don't receive you, dust yourself off. Get out of there. Go to a different town. He's talking spiritually too. Amen? <laughs> get away from that house. And the Bible says, if that house hold, doesn't hold your peace, then take your peace with you. If this man doesn't hold my peace, I take my peace. Best to you. I'm going. Amen? I got to do that because if I don't do that, I can't see what I'm doing. If I have something in trading in my life that is interfering into my life, if this man becomes a deuce in my life, that's all I'm going to be dealing with. Amen? I have to remove that in as much as I would love to minister to him, but if he proves to be a fool, but he's not, of course. I'm just using an example. If he proves himself to be a fool, the Bible says let go. If he's not changing, if he's just draining you, if he's just, we've got to choose to get rid of that blindness. Because that's a blind spot. Because if this man stands in front of me all the time, wherever I go, there's an irritation in front of me. It's blindness. I can't see. I remove that blindness. And I see God's blessing. And I choose to say, be blessed wherever you go. God be with you. But I am choosing to take my peace with me because I'm going to be at peace with it. But now if I go here and this man receives my peace, I connect with him. I shake hands with this man and I join with this man because he has my peace now. And we walk together. And now we work together. And we see Christ Jesus together. Amen? What are you willing to do for your household? What are you willing to do for that house within you? Are you willing to get out of your familiar state? Are you willing to get out of that blindness? And people say, well, I don't know if I'm blind. Well, if you're taking the same steps every day, there's some blindness involved. You need to start taking some chances and say, I'm taking another step into God's kingdom. I'm going to the next level. And people say, well, I don't want to change jobs. I'm not talking about jobs. I'm talking about spiritually. But so if you never ever have prayed out loud, that's a step. That's a, that's a step out of the blindness. If you never have prayed in tongues, that's a step of blind, out of the blindness. If you never ever have laid hands on somebody, so if you have never danced before, that's a step out of the blindness. If you have never raised your hands before, that's a step out of the blindness. If you never carried a TV before, it's a step out of the blindness. And whatever it is, you're taking a step out of the blindness when you choose to go beyond your normal steps. Amen? You've got to get out of your normal steps. And so you go out of that place. You're not going to just count one, two, three, four, five. I've done what I need to do today. Three, four, four. Like, it doesn't even make sense. But you go here and, and half the time your life doesn't make sense anyway. So the counting doesn't make sense. And then you go here and, and you, you're just going over and over again. You're going in a crazy cycle here. But you're not willing to take that extra step that's going to take you out of the crazy cycle. Get out of the blindness today. Let God see you today. <laughs> Did you receive today?